Good morning and uh, welcome and, and thank you. Uh, I'm Mike Tuffin, Managing Director of APCO's Washington office. Uh, delighted to welcome you here today to uh, have a conversation with our two very distinguished colleagues. Uh, one <coughs> housekeeping item before, we, uh, before I formally introduce uh, our colleagues. Uh, uh, we want you to have a, a very frank and, and candid discussion. So in, in the spirit of that, uh, just ask that you turn off your, your cameras and cell phones or, or recording devices. So. Uh, so we can really facilitate that, uh, that dialogue. Um, uh, if you're not familiar with APCO, we are an integrated global communications firm and we, we pride ourselves on, on challenging convention. And one of the ways we've, we've always done that is we've always advised our clients to look at communications uh, as a conversation. So we don't advise our clients to talk to people or at people, but with people. And I think that's exemplified by the uh, uh, discussion we have today. Uh, Ambassador Mansing uh, is the former Foreign Secretary of India, as you all know, am Ambassador to the UAE, Ambassador to the United States. Uh, uh, Ambassador Romer, or Tim as we call him, is uh, a distinguished uh, member of Congress representing uh, the state of Indiana, was one of a handful of very distinguished American selected to serve on the 9-11 Commission and then most recently served President Obama as ambassador to India. So we, we have two people who, are, who have been on the front lines of the strategic dialogue between the U.S. and India and uh, uh, they're going to make some opening remarks and then I'm sure would welcome uh, any questions or comments you have. Tim? Yeah, thank you Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for showing up this morning after being up late last night uh, watching the debate. Uh, we appreciate your second or third cup of coffee this morning, and uh, you know by the time uh, Lalit and I get done with our opening comments, I'm sure you'll be vibrant, wide awake, and ready to fire away with some tough questions because there are tough questions to ask uh, with regard to uh, foreign policy issues these days. Uh, I want to start um, after saying how delighted and honored I am to share a stage with you, Lalit. Uh, we are so lucky to have you at APCO. Uh, on the ground every day in India, working with our offices in Mumbai and New Delhi, and providing such not only great strategic insight to the relationship and the business community, but being there 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week, and working with the team there. So great to have you here, and I look forward to uh, meeting with you later on in the day and, and talking you. through some of these issues. Uh, I remember vividly when President Obama came to visit um, India in 2010. And he said as we announced ten billion dollars in sales to the government of India sustaining or creating 26,000 American jobs at home. He said, Tim, what is the single best experience that you've had in India since you've been living here with your family that really <coughs> highlights the importance strategically of this relationship? And I looked at him and I said, Mr. President, that is a very unfair question. You have 10 of those experiences every day living in India. But I'll try to give you one which really captures why India is such an indispensable partner to the United States today in a very, very complicated and volatile world. On October 2nd, which just took place a few days ago in India, Indians celebrate Gandhiji's birthday. And in order to celebrate that birthday, they invite every major religion in India to Raj Ghat in Delhi, which is where Gandhiji's eternal flame burns, just like John Kennedy's grave here in Arlington. In the United States, if you asked every major religion to come to a ceremony, you'd probably have five or six major religions, and the, the event would take, you know, 20, 30 minutes. In India, 24 different religions show up for this morning event. And after about three hours, you begin to think as Jains and Hindus and Sikhs, Muslims and Christians and Jews all read and pray from their holy documents, you begin to think not only is India a beacon of religious diversity and tolerance for the world, but they then layer on something even more important, democracy. 
and people go in a 1.2 billion person country at the state level and the national level to elect these different people from different religions to their legislatures. This democracy is a shared value of uncommon importance and strategic value with the United States and our people. As President Clinton and President Bush and President Obama have recognized India's importance, therefore, to <coughs> difficult problems in Afghanistan, Pakistan, the Indian Ocean, a rising China, Burma, Myanmar, Bangladesh, the economy, a slowing China, a crisis in Europe, and still an economy in India that's growing slowly at 5.6%, what we wouldn't give for 5.6% growth in the United States right now. They've, they've gone from about 9.1% in the last year and a half to about 5.6% growth. Still something when our business community can figure out reservation point and get through some of the bureaucratic and political hurdles in India, a great growth market for us today, tomorrow, and 50 years from now as we try to figure out precisely how to do business in this complicated political environment. So strategically, this is a very important relationship between the United States <coughs> and India for many reasons, and we can get more into those in the question and answer. I want to focus on three things and then hand it over to Lalit to talk about um, uh, you know, his remarks. First, I think with everything going reasonably well strategically and with the world perspective and cooperation with, between the United States and India on counterterrorism agreements, on work in Afghanistan, on work that the United States and Japan and India are doing on uh, humanitarian relief. Um, uh, we signed a new agreement just recently with India on food security with three African nations. We are doing more and more and more with India globally. But on the business side, <clears throat> things can be extremely frustrating, complicated at times, aggravating at times. So I would, I would say we need, as I write in the Washington Post in a recent editorial, we need to concentrate in three areas. One, first of all, let's make progress on current disputes and economic issues between the two countries. Visa and travel issues so that our business leaders, our political leaders can get back and forth easily before that becomes a tit for tat and a problem area. Secondly, in this first area, infrastructure cooperation. We all fly into India. Lalit just came back. I will be flying into India on Sunday. You will fly into first-class airports no matter where you go in India. Brand new airports, state-of-the-art, Delhi, Bangalore, Hyderabad, even in the medium-sized cities, Jaipur, Udaipur. However, once you get out of that airport, your challenges begin. Bridges, roads, <laughs> infrastructure, productivity. The United States needs to be able to compete for those infrastructure contracts and not have clauses written in the business agreements that say we are going to base your competitive um, uh, applicability or progress on having had business in India before. That excludes U.S. businesses. So working with the Indians to find ways to do infrastructure where the Indians will spend one trillion dollars in the next six years on infrastructure projects. We have business acumen, we have business bond financing, we have architecture uh, and architects. We have the right kind of synergies and matchup to help India build out its infrastructure over the, over the next six to ten years. Another area in this first category is pharma and pharma pricing trying to make sure that the Indian people, especially the poor and the middle class, get affordable access to their drugs. And we see the Indian government going back and forth as to what kind of market they're going to have for this. Another issue in that first category um, is nuclear cooperation and energy. 
where uh, George W. Bush uh, signed and, and shepherded through an historic 2008 agreement uh, where we said to the Indians, we trust you and your spotless record on nonproliferation. We want to help you bring electricity to your people, especially in villages and to the poor and to women and to children so they can turn a light on at night and do their homework and their embroidery and employ three new people in a small business in a rural community. We think this nuclear agreement is good for us because we will make the technology in America and ship it to you. We think it's good for India and that it will provide electricity, clean electricity to your people. We signed that agreement, but hence today we have a very difficult time on the liability agreement uh, making sure that um, our businesses like GE and Westinghouse uh, can compete and uh, have access to the states where the Indian uh, um, uh, government has said that they can build their parks. Um, we're making very slow progress there. That needs to be resolved. The second issue which is so important in the business community and to relationship between the United States and India is a bilateral investment treaty between the two countries. Uh, we believe, uh, I believe, um, when I served as ambassador uh, there just a few years ago, that this could open the door between the two countries to positive trade that benefits both communities. We have been unable over the last 20 years in this globalized world to come up with a narrative to convince the American people that trade can be beneficial to them, that it creates jobs in Midwestern cities and in small communities, and that the U.S. and the U.S. worker can compete with anybody. I think with India we can make this case because there are 100,000 Indians in American schools, there are 3 million Indian Americans living in America, running for office, contributing to campaigns on both sides. There really are uh, the ingredients for a different kind of trade relationship between the two countries. And BIT would be the first step. BIT's important because as you talk to the defense community in America, whether it's Lockheed or Boeing or Raytheon or Honeywell or anybody, <coughs> offsets, different requirements that India can put in, even when we do a sale, can be very, very aggravating and frustrating to that sale. So it's not just the sale, it's the details in that sale that can make a difference. And pushing hard to try to make sure that these things are understood by the Indians uh, is very, very important. Then the third issue, and it's the big idea, and some people don't think it's possible. I do. I'm an optimist, is a free trade agreement between the United States of America and the Republic of India. Uh, I believe that this is a reasonable and logical step that the business community, that the political community, that political leaders in the United States, that governors should start talking about now if this becomes possible in the next three to five years. Uh, why is this important? The United States is the biggest economy in the world today, the most powerful economic engine in the world today, and will continue to be so. India may have the largest economy in the world by 2050. We need to engage now so that we latch up these two powerful people with shared values, these two great countries that uh, share uh, interests in spreading democracy and human rights and freedoms around the world uh, that can be a, um, a good influence on other countries in Asia as the Obama administration has talked about this rebalance to Asia. India becomes a cornerstone, a key actor globally, is a risen global power to providing this stability around the world. Um, finally, let me just conclude and, and hand it over to Lalit by saying there is many people in this room that may, or in, the, in looking at the relationship, may look at the glass as half empty. I look at it as half full. Fifteen years ago, we did probably less than $10 billion in trade between the United States and India. Today, 
we're looking at over a hundred billion dollars in two-way trade between the two countries in goods and services. Furthermore, from 2009 to 2011 when I served there, we increased exports from the United States to India by 32 percent per year. Something the president talked about was doubling our exports over a five-year period and we are on par to do that. And India is a key engine of that beneficial trade that allows the United States to make things in America and export them over, overseas and India to buy products that are so beneficial to their economy that needs to grow at five, six, seven percent per year. So I'm an optimist. Um, I think you're going to learn a lot more from Lalit about the current political environment and Chidambaram is the new finance minister. Uh, Prime Minister Singh's recent reforms on multi-brand uh, aviation and telecom sectors, the politics of all that, and then we can answer some questions um, about those issues. But Lalit, I'm honored to have you next to me <coughs> and always fascinated by your insights and your strategic uh, involvement in these issues. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for those kind words. Your words are welcome. It's always nice to be um, next to you, listening to you. Um, I, I can't think of many people who are so eloquent in explaining India and the potential that India has. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I will touch upon some of the issues that Tim has referred to, but basically I want to tell you how much has changed. Uh, I first came to Washington in the early 90s uh, and I want to tell you I am a survivor of the Cold War years in Washington. You can't imagine how frustrating it was to be a diplomat in Washington in the 90s. I'll tell you why. The State Department and the Pentagon had concluded that India had no strategic value for the United States. It was difficult to get high-level meetings for Indian dignitaries coming here. Um, economically, India was described as a basket case, a black hole, and so on. Not worth investing in India. So I want to give you the sense of the change. And I want to refer to an Indian saying, uh, which is that a wise man plants a mango tree so that his grandchildren can enjoy the fruits. Well, I feel I'm lucky because I'm enjoying mangoes in my lifetime. And that's a great feeling. If in 1989, when I first came here, somebody would have said, can India and the United States be friends? I would have said, probably not in my lifetime. It will probably have the same chances of having a black president in the United States. <laughs> Okay. Exactly 10 years later, I was the Foreign Secretary in Delhi and I was preparing to receive President Bill Clinton in India. It was a, an American presidential visit after 22 years. And if you had asked me the question, can India and United States be friends, I would have said maybe 50-50. It was promising at that time. Now, uh, I come to Washington a year after Clinton's visit and if you pose that question to me, I would say, what kind of stupid question is that? <laughs> As Prime Minister Vajpayee said, India and the United States are natural allies. I think it's our destiny to be friends. And I agree entirely with what you have said, Tim, about how we are united by common values and common goals. So there you are. But the surprises haven't ended. I thought beyond the Bush years, you can't take Indo-US relations further. But President Obama has done it. And so I think you have to see the pace of change to understand how much has changed. Imagine that in the last 10 years, we have received three American presidents. And in the preceding, preceding 50 years, there were, there were only three such visits. So this is how much has changed. This is not just a sea change, I call it a tsunami change. And it's, it's a, a matter of pride for me to be sitting next to Ambassador Roma uh, and to feel this, that uh, <coughs> we are the symbols of that change. And if I may add with a little modesty, we have also been the instruments of that kind of change. So um, what is driving the relationship with India? 
and how is India looking at the rest of Asia? Because that, I think, is the title, the rebalancing. Now, we have a different vision of Asia. We are in Asia. We are in the heart of Asia. And we are at the crossroads of Asia. To the north, we have Central Asia. To the west, we have the Middle East. To the east, we have Southeast Asia, the Asia Pacific. To the south, we the Indian Ocean. We are banged there in the middle. So when America talks of balancing, it is an American idea of balancing. We are already balanced. We are there. We are in perfect equilibrium. We are there in Europe, uh, in, in Asia. And the whole business of looking towards Asia began not recently, but with Pandit Nehru in 1947. His uh, vision was that 20th century would be a century of Asian resurgence and be led by two countries, two old civilizations, India and China. Unfortunately, it didn't work out because China had a different agenda. China didn't want Asian resurgence. China wanted China's resurgence, which has taken place, fortunately. So what we are seeing is a resurgence of Asia, finally, but it is taking place in a different way. And it is taking place, so far as India is concerned, by a partnership, a strategic partnership between India and the United States. So what I'm very happy about is when President Obama talks about the pivot towards Asia, we feel that it coincides with our own vision of engaging Asia all around us. And President Obama gave us very good advice when he came in 2010. We had a policy called Look East, and he said, don't just look East, act East. And that's precisely what we are doing. Now, <coughs> I will skip the foreign policy issues, and let me come to some of the business issues that you have raised. Um, there is no dearth of the profits of gloom and doom on both sides, uh, whether it is in Washington or in Delhi. And if you read some of the articles coming out in the media, it would appear to you, especially if you read the Indian media, I'm not sure about the American media. If you read the Indian media, uh, you'll get the impression our growth story is coming to a shuddering stop. You know, nothing is happening. We are dysfunctional. The whole system is collapsing. And um, um, there is no future. It's the, the growth story has come to an end. And there are some, I can give you a dozen examples which will support this theory. Um, it is true, the government in Delhi appears to a lot of Indians to be dysfunctional. There is a coalition government. Uh, the government is finding it difficult to take tough decisions. They have to carry the coalition partners, and it's not easy. So there is, uh, there is a slowing down which has threatened economic re uh, reforms. India's growth has slowed down from 9%, as Tim just said. Our official figures are that we are still growing at 65 but whether it's 6.5 or 5.6, it doesn't matter. The point is, our growth has slowed down. And during the last few years, last three years, the stock exchange, the Sensex, has been one of the worst performers in the world. There's a budget deficit. We have a fiscal deficit and a budget deficit. The fiscal deficit this year is 4.2% of our GDP, and that's only the federal government. If you take the state's deficits, it's close to 10%. That's not a very happy figure. Uh, <coughs> the budget presented this year in March was to many of us a disastrous budget. And this is what has caused anxiety the world over and has led to these predictions of gloom and doom. Um, foolishly, I think, the government decided to open up tax cases. And the most celebrated case is that of Vodafone. The government armed itself with powers through an act of parliament to open up cases from 1962 onwards. They haven't done it, but they have the powers to do it. And investors are nervous about investing in India because the government has the powers to open up settled cases. Then you have a series of scams which have come out in India. Multi-billion dollar scams in the mining sector in spectrum allocation and in other, other areas. These have been brought to light by an Indian institution. It's called the Controller and Auditor General. 
is a statutory body that audits the accounts of the government of India and brings out faults. And this is what they have done. So <coughs> what these reports show is there is pervasive corruption in so far as big contracts are concerned amongst the politicians and senior civil servants. And so if I tell you all this, why do I expect you to put your money in India? Uh, that's, 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 I want you to listen very carefully to what I have to do. Um, firstly, if you are discouraged by coalition politics, look at the rest of the world. Look at the whole of Europe. Is, it, is democracy easier through coalition politics? But the fact is that is democracy. As Winston Churchill said, this is the worst form of government, but they still haven't found a better one. So um, this is a fact of life. You're finding it in the United States. Bipartisan politics are changing. Politics are polarized. Decisions are getting more difficult. True. Now, there are serious gaps in governance, corruption, and so on and so forth. But I uh, don't get discouraged when these scams are exposed. I welcome the exposure of scams. Why? Because in a democracy, it leads to a process of cleansing. In a dictatorship, it is swept under the carpet so that you don't hear about these things because everything is controlled. In a democracy, everything is exposed. So when I hear about scams and the government is grappling with this as a political issue, is going to affect their fortunes in the next election, I think the system is going to change. Because everybody is focusing on this. The government, the opposition, the controller and auditor general, the judiciary, the parliament, everybody is working on this single issue called corruption. And it can only get better. It cannot get worse. Okay. The fundamentals of the Indian economy are sound. We may be going up and down from 9.9% to 6.5%. But the point is, if you look long term, there is no doubt that India is in a fundamentally healthy shape in terms of its economics. Um, <clears throat> the, I'll quote something from the National Intelligence Council of the United States, which has just published a report. And it says that by 2030, India will be the rising economic powerhouse that China is seen to be today. Sometimes it is difficult to believe these projections. My favorite is that of the Citibank Financial Services, which predicts what 2050 will look, uh, look like and lists the major economies of the world by 2050 by PPP terms. And here is what it looks like. India, $86 trillion of GDP. China, $80 trillion. And I'm sorry to say, United States with $39 trillion. Well, it may be a few trillions here and there, but that is the trend. And that is where I think India is going to fit in. I, I'll quote another very respectable figure, the economist Martin Wolf. And Martin was commenting on what India is going through now. <laughs> and he said that India's, India's GDP is set to rise 43% between 2007 and 2012. That's not as good as China's because China's is 56%. But Martin Wolf said that's certainly better than most of the leading economies of the world. So I want you to understand that Indian economy is on the right trajectory. And these are problems that you are facing now and then. It's not going to affect how India is grow going to grow in the future. Let me tell you some of the benefits uh, which India has over other countries. We have 550, 570 million people below the age of 25. This is the youngest major country in the world. When elsewhere, the Europeans are aging, China's aging process has started. And mind you, China will not only have an aging population, China will have a predominantly male population with this gender balance askew. It's not going to be as productive as China has been in the last 30 years. By 2020, India will account for 12 to 15 percent of the economic growth of the world. And that, I think, is what you have to look for. Let me re uh, 
give you some of the projections of the financial outlays that are going to take place in India in the next few years. $150 billion worth of new power projects coming up in the next five years. $60 billion worth of roads to be built. $21 billion of investments in ports. $110 billion in civil aviation. India is going to invest $1.72 trillion in infrastructure projects in the next five years. So, uh, <coughs> revenue from IT and ITES industries expected to be $285 billion by 2020. And so, if I were to ask you a simple question, where do, where do you think, if you had a dollar to save and to invest, where would you like to put it? I think the answer is obvious. Uh, I will guide you towards India. Now, let us look at some of the issues that uh, uh, Tim has just raised. One of the complaints about India is that the reform process had been stalled. And the grievance was against the Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, because he was considered to be the architect of reforms. In 1991, he was the finance minister who brought in these revolutionary reforms in India. And there is a second stage of reforms. And in, in six years of, of governing India, the government led by Dr. Manmohan Singh had not been able to carry through the reforms. Now, I can explain the reasons why he couldn't do it. It was the coalition politics. In the first four years, he had the communists as his partners, and they didn't want any reforms, and certainly not any reforms that they thought would benefit the United States. It didn't matter that, it, that India was uh, there to benefit, but if the Americans are going to benefit, the communists don't want it. But that is past. We went through the nuclear deal, and Dr. Manmohan Singh risked the future of his government by challenging the communists, asking them to quit the government, won a vote of confidence, and the nuclear deal passed in the Indian parliament. Now, I think what we are going through now is another nuclear deal moment. And this is how it is. Dr. Manmohan Singh was battered by criticism. People said he's ineffective, he's ineffectual. Time magazine brought out a cover story calling him an underachiever. And his friends started criticizing him for not being able to perform. And what you see now, you see a new Manmohan Singh emerge. Somebody who is stung by criticism. He swung into action. And in a few days in September last, last month, we had a series of reforms which has pushed the economy forward. These reforms re uh, relate to uh, uh, single-point retail, multi-brand retail, uh, opening up the civil aviation sector, opening up the broadcast sector. These are fundamental economic changes which had been stalled in the political process in India. You rightly mentioned that Chidambaram has come back. Chidambaram was part of the original reform team. When uh, Manmohan Singh was finance minister, Chidamar was the commerce minister. And they formed this close team which pushed the reforms together. Chidamaram has just been moved from the home ministry to the finance ministry. And within a few days, you could see the difference. The, one of the first announcements he made was that a lot of the budget proposals will be kept on hold. And now we know two of the most objectionable aspects of the budget one was the general avoidance of tax rules, which uh, the previous finance minister had said we will implement. That has been put off, and I suspect it will be put off indefinitely, because it threatened investors with opening up their cases and scrutinizing their tax returns and so on. It wasn't a nice thing to do when we are looking for investments. The other thing that he did was he gave assurance to Vodafone that there'd be no rash action taken. And the idea is not to harass people who have brought money to India, but to look at them sympathetically in a tax-friendly manner. So you have a new team. 
you have a, a new energized prime minister and i think it is going to last uh, i i uh, heard what the finance minister said i think it was last week when he said there is more to come this is just the first installment of reforms we are not going to be intimidated by the opposition or by coalition partners we are going to go ahead and that is why i am happy i am here today and not a month earlier because i wouldn't have given you <laughs> this assurance that that i would have been defensive on india i'm pretty happy to go on the offensive to tell you we have overcome our big inhibitions and we are on the path of progress so i don't think i hope you are not concluding still that india is not good, good for business but um we should keep in mind that the entire world is going through the worst economic crisis in the 30s and we <coughs> all have to get out of it together i would be reluctant to dismiss india's slow down as being permanent just as i'd be mad if i say don't invest in the american economy because america is not growing i know america will grow i know india will grow and i think together we have to grow so instead of losing faith in each other i like to say let us work together and work towards president obama's vision of making the indo us partnership the defining partnership of the 21st century thank, thank you, you tim very nice thank you thank you Well, why don't we open it up for uh, some some of those hard-hitting questions from all the Indian experts in the uh, audience who have been to India several times and and have specific questions, industry questions about uh, what uh, I've said and what Lalit said. First, the good news. Uh, We're doing extremely well uh, from where we were ten years ago. Uh, virtually no defense sales between the two countries ten uh, to twelve years ago. Today uh, we have sold C-17, C-130Js, uh, helicopters, uh, naval equipment, counterterrorism equipment, uh, more and more intel sharing between the two countries. uh I signed an historic uh, new MOU between the two countries outlining 16 new areas of cooperation on intel and CT issues which will probably lead to even more uh areas of defense cooperation something we haven't talked much about homeland security uh, hardware software seaport uh, commercial aviation issues that uh, the Indians are very interested in uh great potential there uh we won a series of uh, different defense deals then we did not win the MMRCA and then we won uh, another series of 8 to 10 billion dollars in the pipeline so there's a lot of good news in the relationship there is some frustration in the relationship <coughs> and i personally lived it um the requirement for offsets that defense companies are burdened with today is becoming so so difficult that uh, some defense companies are saying it's it's going to put um a crimp in whether or not they can continue to compete in that environment unless the Indians are um uh, more open to uh, doing something about the offsets and expanding what an offset means the definition of an offset um i think uh you know transfer of technology something you mentioned uh, we have bureaucracy on our side that secretary gates and i when he was in india a couple years ago talked about how do we try to make sure that we can transfer technology to the indians that is not uh, you know raytheon or or boeing or lockheed or or honeywell's intellectual property rights uh things they've invested in but maybe you know if we can do a nuclear uh, security agreement with the indians we can trust them with uh you know certain sensitive technologies as well where appropriate and we need to modernize our bureaucracy on our side at dod and state and fms 
so that we can compete with other countries in the world, the Europeans, the Israelis, uh, other defense companies that can turn sales around more quickly than we can. We cannot have an antiquated system here that puts us behind the competitive curve in our, uh, in our sales overseas. And so industry pressure within our system, as well as you know, on the Indians, um, I think uh, is critically important. Um, when you look at defense cooperation between the United States and India, we do more defense exercises with India than any country in the world. More than Great Britain, more than Japan, more than anybody else. Malabar, uh, all naval exercises, uh, all kinds of other things that we're doing, um, and that will probably increase. Now, we need to be sensitive to the Indians. Uh, Lalit uh, mentioned their neighborhood, uh, their politics. Uh, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, China, all in the areas uh, uh, around uh, India. I think it's not wise for the United States to, you know, march into India and insist on, um, publicly insist on things that uh, make the politics even more difficult for us to, to do this quietly um, and do more uh, on the defense side and the CT side quietly. You know, that brings up the whole question of Iran. There are some people that are critical of India on the Iran issue. Um, I, again, lived this for close to two and a half, three years. India has voted with the United States and in their interests uh, with respect to Iran at the IAEA the last four times. Uh, India has publicly said that they do not want uh, Iran to get a nuclear weapon and will work uh, toward that goal. And thirdly, uh, India has cut their uh, exports from Iran, oil and gas, from 16 percent to about nine and a half percent. Very significant progress. And so where we can see their help on these strategic issues and defense issues um, in the global community, um, you know, I, I think that's very much in both countries' interest to do that and to do it in effective ways rather than just loud ways. Well, I, I, <clears throat> I would agree with uh, what Tim says. And thank you for showing sensitivity to some of India's concerns. Uh, on defense trade, let me refer to you, uh, to you to a Washington Post article which came up on the 1st of September. Uh, it, when it talks about the strategic defense partnership between India and United States, it says it's a match made in heaven. And they explain why. This is a partnership between the world's largest weapons manufacturer and currently the world's largest weapons importer. So you have, you have a situation which is favorable to both countries. But as Tim said, there have been frustrations on both sides. Now, he explained the frustrations on the American side in dealing with the Indian bureaucracy. The problems on the Indian side are that you had restrictions on transfer of technology. And it's only after we signed the nuclear deal and slowly, uh, in an incremental way, these restrictions are being removed. Now, the Commerce Department maintains that 99% of high technology licenses are issued without a problem. But the point is, the really difficult issues never go to that stage. And a lot of critical technology is still being held up, not because India has done something that invites uh, suspicion from the United States, but because you have rules which are a throwback from the Cold War years. And this is a big problem. We want, want you to tell us, if you're going to sell this weapon system to us, you are going to pass on the technology to us. That is our policy. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, other p uh, frustration that Americans have is about our <coughs> offset policy. Now, you may not like it, but that's one of the ways by which we will have to acquire some sort of self-reliance in defense. A big power cannot be dependent on imports when a war is going on. And you may not like it, but we don't have a happy experience in the United States. Twice, after 1974 and after 1998, there were such severe restrictions placed on India that you couldn't get a pen imported by India without going through, you know, your mandatory 
uh, interagency consultations. And repeatedly we have seen, you buy American equipment and when you need the spares, the Congress will say, stop. We had the light combat aircraft, something that was uh, decided between President Reagan and Mrs. Indira Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi. It was that we will jointly develop the state-of-the-art light combat aircraft. Halfway through that, the Americans imposed sanctions and we were left high and dry. We had nowhere else to go and we have indigenized it, we have patched it together, we made the plane fly. So when we import equipment and we are going to make America the biggest uh, supplier of defense equipment replacing the Russians and, and the Israelis, we want to make sure that we don't face the kind of difficulties we have faced. And we have got a robust private sector and a very active public sector. They may not be the most efficient, but you give them a challenge, they'll come up with it. And we've had a few success stories. Uh, I don't think, I don't know if the gentleman from Lockheed Martin is here. We've got uh, Susan and uh, Anne and yeah, Mark. Yeah, here well, <coughs> I heard about this story from the Indian media and from the American media. Lockheed Martin are going to supply the Super Hercules aircraft. Okay. They have entered into a collaboration with Tata's and the wings and the tails, or part of the wings and the tails, are going to be manufactured in India and brought to Atlanta and fitted with the aircraft. That's the kind of thing we want. We've, we've got skilled manpower, we've got the best of IT brains in the world. You use what you have in India and produce your stuff at cheaper rates. And so a progressive transfer of technology is what we are expecting. But there are still problems on the American side in doing that. On defense cooperation, we had three foundational agreements and we were told, unless you sign them, we cannot give you further sensitive technology. And India hasn't signed it with any other country and India took a stand. This is based on suspicion. If you think we are a strategic partner, you can't say, sign on the dotted line and give all these assurances before we are going to sell you equipment. Okay. So this, there was a stalemate and last two, three years, we had a tough time in negotiating defense deals. Secretary Panetta went there in, in uh, uh, July, followed by Deputy Secretary Ashton Carter, and many of these have been resolved. And I think the Americans have taken the sensible view that India is trustworthy because India has has a track record of not transferring technology to any other country. So why do we insist on signing on the dotted line and waiting for that before we can do business? I think that's a very sensible way. We've set aside these agreements and the talks are proceeding well. Eight billion dollars we've already spent buying equipment. You know, unfortunately, the jet fighter deal didn't go through because I don't think American suppliers took it seriously. We, you were competing with the state of the art from other suppliers. And it was a transparent process under which the, uh, the planes were evaluated, put under trial, and then the financial offers were considered. The American planes, which are 20, 20 to 30 years old, did not perform as well as the competitors from Europe. And uh, I think American suppliers have to accept it. There was a time then when we didn't have foreign exchange. We, we had to depend on second grade Soviet origin equipment. We had no choice. Today we have a choice and we want you to sell us the best that we can afford. And part of that is give us the best technology. So forget the fighter deal, that's gone. But there are so many other deals coming up. Eight to ten billion dollars more in the pipeline. I think we are doing extremely well. So I'm hopeful. On the offset policy, you have to get used to the fact, locate the right private sector suppliers. You've got Tata's, you've got, you've got Reliance, you've got um, Larson and Tuber, you've got a whole range of Indian companies that are globally competitive. And there's no reason why you can't enter into joint ventures with them and do the local manufacturing that is required. Now, I don't often disagree with Lalette, um, but I do have to say uh, on that point, uh, for the record, for the record uh, 
uh, <laughs> on the competition on the MMRCA, I would uh, respectfully and politely say with the F-16s and the F-18s that uh, we do have the best radar technology in the AESA. We do have birds that would have uh, not been 20 or 18 years old. And uh, I think in terms of their performance and their capabilities, uh, certainly with the French Raphael, uh, there was little comparison. I think well, it, and you and I can agree to disagree sure. that the United States won a bunch of contracts, C-17, C-130Js. They weren't going to win an MMRCIA and then come back and, and win more. I think there was something to, uh, um, you know, spreading out some of the wins and the dependency. On the offsets, I would just hope, Lalette, that you could be someone who has a, uh, a conduit to India um, could help us explain that if 30 percent offsets are required, particularly in the defense side, on defense infrastructure, that if they expanded that definition to education, to schools, to energy projects, and that could be something that would not only benefit American companies and keep them competitive uh, in these contracts, um, providing the best technology to India, but also help India on key infrastructure issues. And I don't ask you to respond to it just as part of that. And then the third part would be, your point about um, the Indians saying oftentimes that if we sell something, um, there's a likelihood or a possibility that Congress could act and either rescind or stop something from being transferred. I heard that often, and that's a legitimate thing felt by the Indian people and the Indian politicians. However, we now have in the Senate the largest U.S. Um, caucus in, in, in our United States Senate now, led by a Republican and a Democrat, Mark, Cor uh, Mark Warner and John Cornyn, is the U.S.-India caucus. Uh, Forty-two senators, I believe. I, I set it up. You set it up. So yeah. you, you in have... 2004. And then on the House side, you have, I yeah. think, close to 100 members of the U.S.-India caucus. The days are over that the United States Congress is going to say that, uh, you know, we're going to punish India on a defense deal. I think that was in the Cold War mentality, but I don't think that's going to happen again. But we, we, we don't need to... No, I, 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 I respect what you say, and I'm glad to hear that Congress may not do it. But from time to time, we get this feeling, you know, uh, we saw a bit of that on the Iran debate, and it got us worried that the issues were not Iran per se, it related to American presidential elections. And the rhetoric was coming out and uh, threatening noises were being made. This, this uh, creates nervousness in India. You, we, uh, not many people understand your political system. You know, obscure as our system is, I think it, it takes a great deal of punditry to understand the American political system. And so uh, you have to erase those memories of the past where where supplies, critical supplies were held up when we needed them most. Now, on the offset policy, what you have suggested sounds sensible, but our goal is we want to master defense technology. We want co-production. We want co-designing. So if you uh, make up the offset in terms of education and in sectors not related to defense, we are not going to realize this goal. And secondly, the trade associations, FIKI and CII have been warning the government, be very careful, there is no real transfer of technology taking place. And this is also an argument which is being used by the industry association saying, don't raise the cap on foreign investments in the defense sector. Because as it is, there is so much of reluctance to transfer technology. If they get 51 percent, you will be, you will have no leverage to expect them to fulfill it. So we have to find a way by which we must assure each other that we are doing it in good faith. Well, I like your comment about it being sensible. Let's, let's, let's look for that, that principled compromise. Co other questions? You've got the layer of 
you know, expediting business travel between the two countries. You know, 10-year visas, multi-year visas, so that business women and businessmen uh, w who are engaged more and more between these two countries can almost effortlessly travel uh, back and forth. Um, um, you've got, uh, you know, the second layer is the respective ambassadors and state departments working through this and working through the issues so that opening up new consulates or new cultural centers don't become ingredients or impediments to the visa issue and become part of the negotiations to other things. Visas, travel, expedited travel, safe travel that respects both countries' national security interests and counterterrorism issues um, are high on the agenda, but we can balance both. Um, you know, trying to make sure that uh, a David Headley, who was residing in the United States but traveling between Pakistan and India, who reconnoitered uh, the Mumbai attacks, uh, we can catch somebody like that, but that, you know, regular business travelers that go five or six times a year, if not more, that they're not caught up in this process, and there are ways to do that. And then thirdly, it's the immigration bill that needs to go through Congress. Uh, we have 103,984 Indian, uh, uh, Indians in American colleges. That is a great investment in our country, in our economy, in our higher education system. Duke and the University of California, Berkeley, did a study back in 2006, 2007, and they said every high-level master's and college graduate that comes in from a country like India about 24 to 25 percent of the new jobs in America are created by these graduates that then go off and start businesses in Silicon Valley, the Research Triangle in North Carolina, up in Albany, New York. We want these students to stay in America. If you get a PhD or a master's degree in America and you have studied and come here from India, you should have something stamped on your, your, your paper saying you can stay in America. That's smart for two reasons. One, it's proven that they help us create jobs and grow our economy. Two, we don't want them going to other places and competing against our economy. And they're having more and more choices in the world to do that. Uh, they can work in Bangalore and Great Britain and Beijing. Uh, we want them working in Boston. Um, so, you know, those are the three things that I think the United States needs to act on and see bipartisanship work in our oftentimes paralyzed gridlock system that we have here in our Congress. Uh, we should make our system work better uh, to make our economy work better. Um, I agree. Uh, I feel we have a pretty dysfunctional visa system. But uh, <clears throat> let me explain. I was here during 9-11, and I know uh, the kind of turmoil that the U.S. went through with his visa system and how difficult it was to obtain a visa. And even if you had a visa, how difficult it was at the airport to convince the immigration officer that you are here for legitimate purposes. I remember that the visa system was changed. I had a 10-year visa as a diplomat. And one day I was told by the American embassy, this is not good enough anymore. Uh, you have to have a fresh visa, applied for a fresh visa. Then I went to the embassy, had my fingerprinting done. They took photographs of eyes. It's quite an involved procedure. So this is because of national security, and we understand it. We had the recent experience of uh, of, of 26-11 and our intelligence agencies went haywire saying stop this stop that and this is what we are suffering and uh, we need to make a reasonable visa system and we have to cooperate with each other and get that done uh, it's not easy for getting visas for professional people in the United States that's one of the issues we are discussing bilaterally and at one stage the government of India was so upset uh, it was threatening to take the United States to the WTO. Uh, I believe that this is now on hold. So I think we have to discuss, understand each other's problems and find a solution. Um, 
my understanding is that foreign investment is allowed and a lot of foreign companies are negotiating these agreements uh, the problem is not about the investment rules the real problems are land acquisition getting state level clearances and so on this is where the worst problem has been we have a green bench on the supreme court i i don't know if there are many green benches in the world but at the highest level uh, a project can be held up at many layers and finally it reaches the supreme court and the supreme court has to give a decision there is one famous case of a uh, uh, an aluminum plant in my home state orissa uh, which was to be built by sterling industries is based in the uk uh, <coughs> it went through the state the state government it went to several governments at the center getting environment clearance uh, getting uh, industrial clearance getting the licenses and so on and yet people went in and put in appeals in the judicial system till it reached the supreme court and finally the supreme court had to clear it the project was held up by at least 3 years that i remember the biggest case of foreign investment in india is that of posco 12 billion dollars for a single steel plant again in my home state has been held up for 10 years because of environment issues because there are poor people who are being displaced tribals who are being um, uh, removed from the traditional homeland um, what you saw in the film avatar is actually happening in many parts of india today and there is a lot of sympathy for the poor tribals who are being asked to shift because the mineral wealth of india is located in the tribal areas but uh, more sensible regulations are coming up the government realizes that we can't wait indefinitely and hold up projects that are going to help us with our economic growth so while we are sorting it out i think uh, foreign investors must also look for the place where they are going to invest in my view uh, there are some states which are uh, more investor friendly than other states mm -hmm. and so you have to make that choice uh, when you go for a particular uh, a, 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 a particular partner in india make sure that your location is right and uh, we know apco knows which are the investor friendly states and uh, apco does advise give strategic advice saying if you want to set up this particular project we suggest you go to a b c states and perhaps not to x y z uh, because they they have land acquisition problems or uh, local opposition and so on let me just briefly try to address it because i know people have other meetings to get off to um Lalit just mentioned the word avatar. We all have seen the movie. Um, it's actually a, a Hindi word, uh, yes. Sanskrit, uh, for new, uh, kind of a new incarnation. That's right. And when we talk about new and uh, reincarnations or carnations, uh, it brings to mind uh, Mr. Chidambaram, who moved from the home ministry to the finance ministry and seems like a phoenix rising <laughs> up and, you know, coming through with these reforms, multi-brand, retail uh, opening, uh, aviation, civil aviation uh, opening. Uh, uh, this morning in the, the papers in India, they're talking about insurance reform and FDI investment, uh, uh, pension reform. He's driving most of this. Uh, one of the controversial things that the government recently did, uh, as well as uh, in addition to the FDI and the foreign investment, was they, uh, and Chidambaram announced the selling off of some of the state-run exactly. industries. Uh, particularly, you mentioned coal, gas, telecom. They're looking at how that can generate some revenue, increase competition. Will Coal Incorporated be one of those companies that uh, is sitting on a billion dollars in cash and eventually is sold off? Um, how will that increase cooperation? And how, you know, something we haven't spent a lot of time this morning talking about, we talked about a lot of the frustration sometimes and opportunity between government to government. The business to business relationships between India and the United States can be extraordinary. They are now, but they can be even better. If we can figure out the visa issue, uh, something that APCO works on. We helped one of our clients uh, expedite uh, visas so that uh, one of our clients could build a plant on time and get their engineers in there to do it and not cost them more and more money in delay of the construction. Um, those things make a big difference. And, uh, you know, that kind of knowledge. 
The other thing that Lalette just mentioned, which is key, is knowledge of not only the states, uh, Rajasthan, which can be a great investment for energy companies, but who are the chief ministers and governors of those states? Mm. Is it Mamta Energy? Is it Mr. Modi? Is it uh, Nitish Kumar uh, over in uh, Bihar? Is it uh, Mr. Putnik uh, over in Orissa? Who are the people that are more business friendly? and where you know, land acquisition can move more quickly, uh, where they're more innovative and less restrictive on some laws that might allow um, maybe the possibility of the offset issue to be negotiated. Remember, the multi-brand issue, the multi-brand opening that just took place under Mr. Chidambaram, uh, it's 51% uh, ownership. Um, from outside companies like a Walmart or a Tesco or a Carrefour, but it's also dependent upon the states. A state can reject it. Other states can accept it. I think it's come down to nine have accepted ten, it, and ten, ten, have, ten accepted. have accepted, and six have rejected it. Um, who are your partners? Who are your business partners, state partners, uh, land acquisition partner? Those things really matter in the Indian system, just like it really matters in our system. So knowledge of that, I think, uh, puts you ahead competitively. With that, let me thank Lalit uh, once again for his terrific insights, his uh, uh, long travel from India. Um, you don't miss a beat on that jet thank lag, Lalit. You. You, you were tremendous this morning. We really appreciate it. We appreciate your attendance and follow through and look forward to more such opportunities in the future. Thank you very much.